Welcome back for a new episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks. On this episode, we will talk about AMD's Beastly Threadripper Pro 5000 series and all of the wearable and foldable devices Samsung unveiled at Unpacked. Next. Whoa, we are live. We uh, I made it through the intro. We're rolling. What's going on, fellas? Hey, we did it. Um, yeah, so obviously we've been gone for a bit. I think most of that is my fault. I'm Chris Getting, the the next part of the the usual trio, though that's a little mixed up today. But yeah, I've been busy moving from Maine to Kentucky for most of the last month, it seems. But I think I'm finally getting settled, um, and that's brought big changes for me because I'm now with Hot Hardware full time, so off and running. Yeah, man. Good stuff. So that's one of the big changes. Another big change. We have some new team members. Um, I want to introduce everybody to uh, Ryan Whitwam. He, uh, I, I pronounced it wrong, and I asked him just before the cast. Damn it. No, that's, no, um, that's, so, that's good. That's, that's, that was as, good? As close as anybody ever gets. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, meet Ryan. Ryan, why don't you tell everybody some of your background and uh, what, what's, what's some of the favorite stuff you like to talk about in tech? Uh, so I, I cover mostly um, science and mobile technology, including, you know, some things that I've written for hot hardware lately. Um, yeah, cool. I mean, so like, yeah, smartphones, I love foldables, which is, you know, something we're going to talk about today. Um, I also love keyboards. I don't know if anybody can tell. Never would have guessed. Yeah. No, I, I could, could not tell at all. We were chatting before the podcast started, and I was just letting Ryan know. I wrote a blog post in 2009 to demystify mechanical key switches. <laughs> like I was importing keyboards from Japan and now there's just like too many switches I can't keep up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the, the cherry patents expired, I think in uh, like 2012-ish or something. And that's that's why there are now like a billion switches. A lot of clones. Yeah, I'm on a, <laughs> a, a, a control keyboard now with kale box whites that I kind <laughs> of dig. Um, I, I had ordered some custom switches. Uh, Scott Wasson, formerly a tech report, now at Intel, recommended some switches, and I installed them, and they weren't clicky enough, so pulled them out back to the box whites. <laughs> mm. okay. Cool. So I think we should probably get rolling. Um, we have not been on for a few weeks, but there's way too much to cover from all that time, so I'm going to pull out some of the, uh, the big headlines from the last week or so. Um, first up, our man Nathan reviewed the um, the Google Pixel 6a. So this is um, essentially a more affordable version of the the, the Pixel 6 Pro. It's uh, not quite as premium in the build, but similar tensor processor. I believe a little bit less memory and not quite as much storage. Um, but if you're familiar with Pixel phones, not much to see. It performed really right in line with the Pixel 6 and the and the 6 Pro. Uh, Ryan, ha have you seen this device in hand? I, I sure have. I've got one right here. There you um, so what, is, what do you think? It's. I mean, I think it's. It's. A, it's a very good phone, especially for the price. It has the same Tensor SoC that debuted in the six and six Pro late last year, um, and it's you know it's hundreds of dollars less. I think it's four fifty, and the Pixel Six is that starts at six hundred. Um, you get mm -hmm. most of most of the value. I think uh, stepping down to the the six A. Um, the the cameras are not uh, as high resolution. Uh, the display is not as nice. And there are a couple of build quality things that aren't quite there. But I mean, for $450, you get a phone that performs to, to basically two flagship level um, and has a, a pretty good camera despite the low resolution. Um, Google's camera processing is just it's unparalleled. It's crazy what they can do. Even without an actual uh, a zoom lens, you can you can basically just run that phone at 2x uh, digital zoom all the time. and Your photos will turn out pretty good. Yeah. And the other thing, you know, with Pixel phones, getting that nice, clean, you know, unadulterated version of Android and guaranteed updates, kind of a big deal. Um, if you're a phone nerd and you keep your phones for a long time, Pixels tend to be, you know, one of the phones that get updated the longest. So good stuff. Yeah. I got to say, and, I'm um, still using the Pixel 3a XL. So hmm. nice. good longevity. That's, that's probably almost out of update support or maybe <laughs> probably <is> just <laughs> <Yeah>. now. <laughs> I'm looking at updates, but. Yeah, the only thing keeping me off the 6A is really the lack of wireless charging. Um, I don't have yeah, it on the 3A is... XL, and I do miss it from the phones I had before. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that they they cut to to keep the price down. Um, 
And, you know, and Pixel's uh, charging speed is not really impressive. Even the this, the 6 Pro tops out at, I want to say, 23 watts, which is pretty anemic compared to a lot of the competition right now. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Speaking of competition, another <laughs> affordable phone that we covered that actually Ryan covered for us, um, the, the OnePlus 10T recently launched. We have a full review up at the site. Um, Instead of me talking about this phone, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it off to you, Ryan. Why don't you tell us what you liked, what you disliked about this guy? Um, I mean, I think like the real story of this phone is is just speed. I mean, OnePlus made some very I think questionable compromises to keep the price low and still get the kind of performance that they wanted. So there's no alert slider, there's no wireless charging. Both of those are bummers. But uh, it has the latest uh, Snapdragon uh, eight plus Gen one. It has. 125 watt wire charging which is just it's wild it's uh i'm i'm i i have not personally used a phone that charges that quickly before uh, they've been a thing in in asian markets for a while but this is the first one i've used and it's honestly it's like a um it's a transformative experience you basically just don't have to care about your your phone's charge level if if i need to leave the house i just like plug it in find my shoes and then i pick up the phone and it's Good to go. It's either full or close to it. The entire battery, <laughs> zero to a hundred, takes twenty minutes. That is nuts. That's really yeah. crazy. Yeah. The, the, the only the yeah. only real problem with that is that you need to use one pluses. They call it's it's uh, this Oppo uh, technology called SuperVoop, which is a terrible name. Uh, you have to use those chargers. It comes with one, and you can buy more for I think fifty or sixty bucks. Um, that's not ideal. So if you just have a regular USB power delivery Type C charger. Uh, that'll charge the phone at 45 watts, which hey, uh, but if you if you use the OnePlus charger, it's yeah, it's it's lightning fast. It's crazy. Is the one is the OnePlus charger like compatible with other fast charging standards too? So if you have uh, other yeah, devices, so, I mean, it'll, it'll do it? uh, it'll do power delivery up to 45 watts for other phones. Okay, gotcha. um, so cool. that's not you know that's not bad. That's a perfectly reasonable mid range charger. Yeah, definitely. And with the, with the Snapdragon uh, Snapdragon Eight Plus Gen One, super fast performance on that phone too. Um, I don't think it was quite top of the charts in every test, but it was up yeah, there. It, it, up it, yeah, it, uh, it was very close to it, and I think it, it set the set the bar in a couple of them. It's you know, it's a very fast phone. I mean, it's tuned to be very fast. Um, you know, it's just yep. you know, OnePlus has has changed their software a lot in the last year as they've sort of merged operations with Oppo. So I don't love a lot of the like the little things in the software experience and i question how they're going to move forward with that um, but it's not it's not terrible software um, it just does have like some some ui interactions that i think are awkward and some animations that are not great um, and it's missing features compared to older versions of oxygen os that's that's one plus's you know software skin but this is basically uh oppo's color os with a you know a, a little bit of, of tweaking nice and what do you think of the screen and the cameras uh, so the screen is is good. I mean, it's uh, it's only 1080p, you know, I think like 6.7 inches. So, I mean, it could be sharper, but I mean, if you don't have a 1440p or even a 4K phone, like a Sony phone next to it, you're not really going to notice that most of the time. If you get, you know, right up into the, the screen, you might see some some jagged edges, but like whatever. It's otherwise, it's, it's 120 hertz uh, refresh. It has great viewing angles, great brightness. Uh, no real complaints about the screen. The camera setup is another one of those places where OnePlus sort of backed off to keep the price low. So whereas the 10 Pro a couple months ago had uh, an optical zoom camera and a high resolution ultra wide, this has a pretty low resolution eight megapixel ultra wide and a dedicated macro sensor, which is terrible. They're always terrible. Every phone with a dedicated macro sensor is terrible. Um, so I don't, I, they just wanted to have like the three camera sensors. They wanted to like, they, it looks like a, like a stove top, the back of the phone, the camera island does. So it has like four little, you know, the four, four like burners, three of them are cameras and one is the flash. Um, I would have said just, you know, only put the cameras on the phone that are any good, but there's this, this thing in, in mobile, uh, in, in mobile stuff right now where you want to have three cameras. You have to have three cameras because the iPhone has three cameras. <laughs> right. So yeah. many people just check the spec sheet and make their decision off that without actually looking at what it does. Mm -hmm. Which is so why I'm exist. actually uh, on a related note. Speaking of cameras, I, I'm playing with the uh, Honor Magic Four Ultimate. It's it's got the highest score on DxO Mark for any smartphone globally right now. The, the camera bump out on that thing. I, I want to say there's there's four cameras on there. It's huge. It's like the uh, yeah. it's the size of a lens cap on the back of that camera. But the images are really really nice, and it it has a um it has a super macro mode that uses the ultra wide. It, it yeah. focused like literally touching 
the subject. Yeah, it's yeah. still that's. I mean, I think that's that's the way to do macro. That's um, the more expensive OnePlus phones do that too. That's basically just an ultra wide with autofocus. That's how they do that. Yeah. I mean, it is a much better experience than a dedicated macro camera. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Anything else you want to add to that before we move on, Ryan? Or are you good? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I have said my piece. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Okay. So we're probably, let's go back to our core for a minute before we get to Samsung's mobile devices. So we also had Zach take a look at AMD's latest uh, Adrenaline Edition software release. Now, what's interesting about this particular release is it looks like AMD went back and optimized OpenGL and DirectX 11 performance. And, you know, not across the board, but some significant performance gains in some older titles that use those APIs. And especially like we, I don't think we tested Minecraft, but Minecraft showed like a monstrous uh, performance improvement. I think Chris has it up right yeah, there. Right here. So yeah, you know, up to 90%, 92%. But even in other titles, there was some significant gains. Now that's great, right? So I, I think that's interesting to say, hey, look, these graphics cards, here's a free performance boost for these APIs. But after the fact, I'm wondering why go back and optimize DX11 and OpenGL now? And I thought that could have been like an interesting discussion, but we won't really have any answers. Something that popped into my head was some of the recent news about Intel Arc, you know, really being built for DirectX 12 and Vulkan and future APIs. And I'm wondering if AMD took this as an opportunity to tweak performance on those older APIs. So when everybody finally gets to test an arc and you see those older titles, those bars look kind of long on the AMD side. And, and any thoughts on that one, Chris? I mean, I think the <laughs> the the market competition uh, could be part of that. Um, you know, they did do basically a full driver rebuild with this, though I've, I still don't think they've put out really the details on exactly what they did different with this um to do the open gl optimization um so you know it's not typical for companies to go back and improve things in older titles just because they they're, they've got to have a market case for it or else they're kind of from the investor's perspective from the profit making perspective there's kind of wasting developer time um so yeah i think seeing a little achilles heel for uh, the Intel Arc graphics cards coming out could have been a great motivator for that. They could have, you know, also serendipitously just magically found the the secret sauce to make those older titles work with their systems, and it just happened to align. But um, you know, I, there's obviously going to be more developer uh, effort into fully rebuilding the driver than you know just making tweaks here and there to get the newest, you know, the slight iterated iterative gains that they'll do so um yeah i, I think yeah. it could be a sign of competition being good things even if intel's competitive stance is a little shaky right now yeah i'm only partially i'm partially kidding about the intel comparison it's i'm wondering if there's some uh some embedded um device we don't know about yet or some semi-custom mm -hmm. device that's going to use you know amd graphics uh, amd soc that's probably a more logical reason why they would go back and, and optimize for older APIs. But I don't know. I just thought it could make for interesting discussion. We have a couple of comments from Steve's one. I'm not going to pop up on the screen. The second one uh, he's asking um, if, if we ran older titles through Proton and converted to DX9, 10, 11 into Vulcan, if it improves arc performance, not sure about that. That would be interesting, right. uh, actually really interesting to check out. But hopefully we find that out soon enough. Yeah, we did have an article up on the site where, um, you know, Intel had put out their video with uh, Tap and, and Ryan Strout talking about APIs. And they did mention that if games are updated to use the newer APIs, that assuming the developer takes ARC into account, they can get better performance out of it. But again, it's one of those, it's got to be done. And also we're taking their word at it. So, yeah. We've got to see it done um, before we can really believe it. Yep, definitely. So I think we should probably get into the meat there. You know, we haven't been on for, I think, you know, three weeks at this point. So much more stuff posted on the site. Um, if you're not a regular visitor at hothardware.com, please go hit the site because, you know, we post dozens of news stories a day, a bunch of reviews, so much stuff that we covered in the weeks that we weren't live that there's we couldn't possibly talk about it. So hit the site when you get a chance. Now, this week, a couple of really big developments, though. So uh, actually today, Samsung had their latest Galaxy Unpacked event, and this one was 
where the company showed off the latest foldables and wearables. So the Z Flip 4, the Z Fold 4, um, the Galaxy Watch 5 and Watch 5 Pro, and the new Buds 2 Pro were all unveiled today. Now, I was lucky enough to meet with Samsung a little while back and get my hands on all of these devices and play with them for a little bit. We actually have a video that went live today on the channel. So if you haven't seen that, please go check that out and give it a like. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure Ryan's going to have lots of uh, opinions on these devices. But in my quick and dirty, you know, having experienced all of the previous models, um, these seem like they're they're an iteration. They're, there's not a revolution versus the previous gens, but enough refinement and enough improvement was done where you can actually feel the build quality difference. It seems like Samsung, you know, it took these last few generations to really fine tune the design. And perhaps with this generation, you know, the foldables are maybe ready to go mainstream where more people can jump on these devices and not worry about, you know, perhaps durability uh, and usability. With the, the Fold 4 in particular, there's actually a new version of Android on there, Android 12L, that's designed for large screen devices and foldables. And, you know, the latest platform processor in here too, Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, so super performance, better efficiency than the original Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. So lots of stuff to like here. Um, Ryan, I'm going to kick it off to you and get your opinions and we'll, we'll, we'll get the discussion going. Yeah, so um, I, I have uh, not actually touched the new phones yet, um, but uh, I have I have used all of them thus far. I like I I like my daily driver most days is is a, a fold three. Um, I think Samsung has sort of correctly ascertained that they are basically unopposed and foldables right now, so they're taking it they're taking it slow. This is an iterative change, um, just like last gen was. You know, it's they're they're refining. The way these phones feel, they're they're adding the newest hardware, um, and and they're just sort of they're tinkering with the little things. Um, but do you look at what else is happening in, in foldables right now? It's it's basically like there's some things in in Asia, and then there's Motorola, which has not launched a new foldable in almost two years, um, and and Samsung is putting out devices that I think are actually like very good. They're very worth using. I mean, I I use the Fold 3, uh, like I said, I, it's like my my main phone. When I'm not reviewing something, I'm probably using the Fold 3. And um, I mean, and the experience is just, it's it's different enough from a regular smartphone that I think it is, it's it's exciting. It's the first, like the, the, these foldables are the first phones in years that I've felt are like really exciting for me as a person who is a giant phone nerd, um, because everything else is the, you know, is the typical flat glass slab. We tried all these things with Android. There were keyboards, there were like pop-up cameras, all this crazy stuff. And none of it, none of it quite worked. I think foldables are going to work and maybe not just not specifically foldables. I think that as we, as we sort of move into having, having the material science to make this stuff work, uh, I think devices that just sort of change shape that have different, uh, like they can be different form factors in your pocket. I think that's what like the next big thing in mobile is. And right now that's foldables because that's where the technology is. Um, so, you know, with the, the fold four, like uh, Samsung said, they, they made the display, I think 45% stronger than last year. And that's been one of the, one of the pain points of foldables is that it is so easy to scratch and, and dent the, the foldable OLED panels, but every year they're making them a little bit stronger and a little bit stronger, and it's a little bit better. And last year they introduced water resistance, and this year they're like they're tweaking like the screen ratios. Like if you look at the the Fold Three, you can see how narrow that cover display is. So they made the new one just a little bit wider, and therefore like the internal display is just a little bit wider. It gives you a little bit more real estate. So if you want to split screen apps, they're easier to use. You can see more content. Um, and you know, but it's it's uh, it's still like it's still a big phone. It's still like when you yeah. fold the like you know the fold four. I assume it's like the fold three. Like you fold it up and you put it in your pocket. It, it's a brick. Um, the flip four is, I think, is going to be like a really compelling phone for people who don't want to have like a giant you know brick in their pocket. Um, that's the that's I think going to be a really a really cool experience. Those phones are also a lot cheaper. They're only a thousand dollars, and the fold four is going to be eighteen hundred, just like the fold three was. Um, and I mean, and if you if you do like the the pre order deals they have now, I think Samsung will give you uh, if you have the full three, they'll give you nine hundred for it. So you you only lose a hundred dollars of value like over the whole you know the whole year. So you can get the new phone for a hundred bucks. Like that's pretty impressive. Um, and even like other phones, I think like the the S twenty one FE, they will give you seven hundred for that phone. And I think that's that might have been retail price when that came out. Like yeah, that, that's uh, really good. I didn't hear that one. Holy cow. 
Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, that's I mean, you know, if, if you're if you're sold on foldables or you're thinking like maybe you want to try it, like do it, like get the, the early pre order deals with the enhanced trade in values. It's like that's the way to do it. I mean, I haven't looked yeah. at the iPhone numbers, but I assume that they are, you know, pretty, pretty good, too. Yeah, we don't talk about iPhones here anyway. <laughs> the, 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 there's also an additional deal on the flip. Uh, if you pre-order before, I think, the 16th, I forget the exact date. I might have that wrong. Or it might be between the 10th and 25th or something. They'll double the internal storage if you pre-order a flip. Yeah, flip. I think yeah. that they're doing that on the Fold as on the well. Fold okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, and they also, they give you, I think, like $200 in, in accessory credit and a free case. Like, it's, you know, it's a good deal if you, you get in early. Otherwise, you want to wait at least, you know, six six months or so until you know there are more sales but um yep. yeah i mean i i'm i've i've enjoyed the last few generations of samsung foldables i'm almost certainly going to order like the new ones just to have permanently to, like to be my phones um so i don't know take take that as you will as as an endorsement i suppose if, if you trust my opinion <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting since you're a user, I'm probably, I'm going to pepper you with some questions in a minute. But one of the other cool things with the fold, um, you you had mentioned, you know, the larger screen and multitasking with with this version of Android 12 L, a couple couple of cool things that I got to play with. Um, when you fold it kind of in clamshell mode, you now have a taskbar similar to a PC if you want to use it that way. You know, where you have icons along the bottom. And the, the gesture support, gesture support um, for multitasking has been improved where you can now have up to, you can have three apps on the screen and kind of, you know, resize them, slide them around really intuitively. Um, normally that's not the smoothest experience on Android, but you can literally just, you know, throw the apps up there, throw the second app, it'll split screen, throw the third app and, you know, half of the screen will split again. It was, it was a really cool experience. It, it's the software looks like, you know, it looks like Google has embraced the form factor as well and is doing the software work necessary to, to improve the entire ecosystem. Now, since, since you're a, a user, this might be kind of out of left field. What kind of experiences have you had with the phone that's that's really different than just a regular candy bar? Like, what do you do differently with the with your fold that you weren't doing with a different device, you know, a, stand, so a more standard device? I mean, the way most smartphones work, the way, you know, we've been using them for 10 years is it's, it's a modal experience. You do one thing at a time. And, you know, Android, you know, has supported split screening apps for a long time, but it didn't work very well. And a lot of the apps were broken when you split screen them. It was just not a great experience. Uh, and like you said, in the newer versions of Android, they have they have addressed that. And, and now, like in, in Samsung's version of Android Unfoldables, you can you can have up to three apps on the screen. You can move them around. You can save app groups. So. What I so I, I have a few uh, app groups saved. Like I have things that I know that I need for work. Like I just swipe open the uh, the bar, and I can open you know, Slack, Gmail, and Chrome. I have all those up all at once, so I can like you know get down to to work whenever I you know whenever I want to get something done on the go. Um, it's also it's typing on on a foldable is actually it's it's so cool, uh, especially since Google updated Gboard. Uh, with a split layout. Before that, you, you had to use uh, Samsung's keyboard if you wanted to split layout. But the split layout on on the Fold Three, and I assume the Fold Four at least, same uh, is it's so it's so comfortable. Like you have so much space, it just feels like a much more uh, you know comfortable typing experience. And I I get you know many fewer errors. Um, and then uh, just like even if I'm using uh, an app like in full screen mode, which is sometimes kind of a problem. Not all apps <laughs> look great on like, you know, a seven inch Android display, although Google says they're addressing that. Um, but even if I'm just using one big app and I'm like, oh, I need to check something or like I'm, I'm you know, I'm like uh, typing a text and I'm like, oh, I want to look up something on the internet. On another phone, you, you like close that app, you go to Chrome. On uh, the Fold 4, I'm just like, well, I'll just like pop open Chrome. I have that saved in the in the the bar. I can just drop it right next to this. I can do my research and keep typing my text. I don't have to quit doing anything. Like it's it is it is true multitasking on a mobile device. Yeah, I, I think I need to spend more time uh, with this generation because my 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 concerns were mostly about uh, you know physical things with the devices, right? I know I would like the big screen and I know I would utilize it. It was more about durability and, you know, making it practical to carry around. When, when they're folded and there's that little gap by the hinge, yeah, you know, a, I'm a you big know, guy. A... Yeah, like that makes me nervous. Yeah. Like if that's in my pocket and I sit wrong, am I going to squish it? So, I, I mean, I assume that's not really a huge issue or it would be all over the, all over the web. At this point. Yeah, I mean, ever since, so like the first time Samsung tried to release a foldable, I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, the original fold, they sent out review yep. units 
and then almost immediately they started failing. So they had to delay the launch. Ever since then, it's been it's been fine. There haven't been any widespread issues that I'm aware of. I had I had like some minor issues with the this, this, the built-in screen protector on the Fold Two, um, but I haven't had any problems with that on the Fold Three, um, which it still has that you know like a, a screen protector protector. I assume the Fold Four will also have that. It's like the top uh, plastic layer, like the the yes. OLED is underneath that. Um, I haven't had any problems with that on on the newer ones. And I mean, I think that, you know, Samsung's continuing uh, hardware excellence, I think, you know, is very apparent with these devices. They they have this special uh, aluminum alloy. They call it armor aluminum. It's not, you know, like expensive iPhones you can get in stainless steel, which is cool. But on Android, it's it's harder to do materials like that because you have to have a larger battery compared to an iPhone. So when you also add the weight of like a premium material like steel or ceramic that makes the phones just too heavy but i think samsung has found a nice medium uh like their their aluminum i think uh, you know has shown itself to be very durable i've dropped the phone a bunch it's still fine i like i don't i don't worry so much about about breaking it and that's not something i expected i think when i started using these devices i thought i was going to have to baby them a lot but it's been pretty good i mean and the fold 3 even supports and the fold 4 as well does uh supports uh the s pen so you can get you can get you know the the s pen stylus from samsung you can like doodle notes like i've been at i've been at events and like i just used my my fold like a notebook to to take notes and i mean i you can like you know poke the screen with the pen and it and it's and it's fine and that wouldn't have been possible like even a year before, like the the full two, if you poked it with something like even your fingernail, you could leave a dent in that in that screen. But just in a year, it's got it got better, and now apparently forty five percent stronger still. Um, I mean, I think that's like that's that's impressive that Samsung has gotten to this point so quickly, even though they're not you know they're not doing huge hardware changes every year. They're they're making you know the iterative improvements that I think make these devices more compelling, and you know make people willing to spend what is objectively a lot of money. Yeah, I think it was the right approach kind of being somewhat conservative. I mean, it's not conservative to kind of launch Pioneer a whole new segment, but in terms of the the yearly iterations, I think they they took the right approach and we're, it's really more about refinement than revolutionizing each gen. Mm -hmm. Chris, ha have you had any experience hands-on with these foldables? Any, any thoughts on usability or if you'd, uh, you'd enjoy using one? So I haven't had a chance to use either. Um, I mean, I know we mentioned the, the thickness when they're folded up, I don't think that'd be too much of a concern to me because um, until very recently, I was having to carry two phones in my pocket anyway. So the extra <laughs> thickness there, you know, isn't a big deal. It works. Um, um, I guess my biggest thing is I, I would be concerned still that the extra screen you get with the fold it just kind of would make the experience unwieldy. But it sounds like you're saying that it's they've really refined the experience and made it much more intuitive to use. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it it depends on the app. Like, uh, I've noticed, like, if if you open if you open Twitter, you're gonna have a bad time because it is like Twitter. extremely stretched out. Like, you can see it's you know, like the one image takes up like half of the screen. It just oh, doesn't wow. understand. <laughs> it just doesn't understand big screens. But that's one of the apps that supposedly is getting a more like uh, a tablet and foldable friendly interface. But yeah, but I mean, if you it'd if be you, nice you, if you could get like a tweet deck experience on there and have multiple streams yeah, set up. That would be boy, that would be nice. If if Twitter hadn't killed all the third party apps, that would be great. Mm. But that is not the world that we live in. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, otherwise, I, I do like the way the flip folds down to just a smaller height, even if it is yeah. just a regular candy bar size screen. Um, yeah. Yeah, this you know, thing like it's like you just drop it in your opinion. pocket and it, it like disappears. It's so cool. Yeah. Um, you know, my first phones were the flip phones from mm -hmm. I think I had a LG flip phone at one point. Then I had, of course, the Motorola Razor that everyone had. Um, you know, and I, I do miss that just kind of kinesthetic tinkering, opening and closing, and that kind mm -hmm. of experience, plus the satisfaction of just Clipping, flipping it closed when you hang up a call. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the rage hang up is is yes. a thing. Uh, you know, I mean, I really like the external display on this on this phone too. It's it's um an experience that I I have missed during the smartphone era because you can just sort of glance at it, you can see what's happening, and you don't have to get sucked in to like all of the things that are possible on the larger display. I think it's kind right. of like it's a polite phone to use around people. Maybe people of a certain age who remember flip phones. Like you could just glance at the screen and it's not like you are checking out of the conversation. You are like, you know, just checking the time and your notifications and you set the phone down. You didn't even open it. It's fine. Yeah, it's it's really flexing to brag that you had the same phone that millions of other people also had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so 
you know, what I really like about the Fold 4 that I think you briefly mentioned is that when it is in the folded up mode, the screen is wider now. So it should be less claustrophobic to use because that's the other concern I had when when you're using it in just the single display mode, I guess, whatever you want to call it. Um, having such skinny apps can also be a problem where you're just kind of running out of like, say you're reading an email, you're running out of words on the line and you've already got to jump to the next one and can create a yeah. messier experience. Yeah, it is. It is a lot of it's a lot of scrolling. Yeah, some apps just don't render correctly on on that really narrow display. I mean, the new one is not substantially wider. I think I think Samsung said three millimeters, so it's not it's not a huge difference. But every little bit helps when you know when when you're using that cover display. So you know, we have to move on to the watches in a second. But one question: It seems like there was a bit of um, a bit of commentary today about how visible the creases still are on, on Samsung's phones, where I guess some of the, the Chinese manufacturers are, are somewhat minimizing the look of that. In, in your experience actually using a phone, is the crease an issue? I, I mean, when the screen's lit up, you can hardly see it. It's really only when the screen's yeah. black. That I mean, you see it, it. it depends on like the angle and like what content is on the screen, uh, like a, a lighter uh, a lighter app. And if you just sort of look slightly off angle, you can see the crease. Um, looking at it dead on, you almost you see almost nothing. Um, it's can not you feel a it? huge. You can feel it. Yeah, it's not a huge problem for me. I mostly forget that it's there. I do notice it though when I'm like using the S Pen to like take notes, and every time the tip like goes over the crease, there's a little like the little you can feel the little divot, right. and it just slight. It just feels slightly off. Um, it's. I mean, yeah. Some some OEMs have managed to decrease the visibility. Uh, of the crease. Um, I don't know why Samsung doesn't seem to be focusing on that. It might be like a material thing. It might just be better to do it this way right now if you want to make, you know, the the display a certain way to, to do certain things. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not a deal breaker for me. Um, it might be for some people. I, I understand like people are weird about that stuff. But um, I, I, you know, I'm pretty sure that it'll get better eventually. It's just, you know, right now it's not uh, a huge deal for me. Right. I would imagine having that little bit of extra play in there also would help with durability because it's not being pulled quite as taut as it would if, if they were trying to fully remove the, the crease. Yeah, I mean, if you want to like, there are there are things you have to do to to eliminate the crease that I think are, are suboptimal, like Motorola on, even though it hasn't released a fold for a while, on its uh, razor foldables, the screen actually like slides at the ends and it um it doesn't like fold uh, flat it sort of stays like u-shaped mm -hmm. um and that helps to reduce the crease it actually has like a couple of like really like small faint creases but I, it's it's you know less obtrusive than the one big one um but they've also had more durability problems than samsung has had on on the flip phones so i think maybe the way samsung is doing it right now is just better with you know the materials that are currently available yeah, I think that's why it's there is to ensure that the screen opens a certain way every time. Like if it, it, there's a possibility of it going the other direction, that's when you have a problem, you know. Mm -hmm. So moving on, um, if anybody has questions on those devices, throw them in the chat. But we're going to we're going to move on to the actually, you know, that was a really cool part of the video <laughs> at the event for the bespoke edition of the flip. There was a robot that was building the phones for you. You picked your color scheme and it built the phone like right up right up in front of you and then spit it out. It was pretty wild. Yeah, it's it's cool that they have that available out of the gate this year. That was a, a late arrival last time, but I'm yeah. man, I, I kind of want to just get like some some wild colors on on a flip four. That would be cool. Yeah, definitely. So moving on to the watches, we'll be quick on the watches um, because the experience is really. I, I'm still rocking one of the originals. Surprisingly, the battery still lasts four <laughs> days on this wow. thing. Um, and the experience is very similar on the newest devices. Just really a refinement in the design. Um, you know, updated SOC. Uh, better power efficiency. So Watch 5, Watch 5 Pro, there's two sizes of Watch 5 coming, a 40 millimeter and 44 millimeter. Really, the only difference in those two is, is the physical size and the size of the battery, much smaller battery in the 40 millimeter device. And the Watch 5 Pro has a really big battery, 590 milliamp hours in that one, the biggest battery in, in any watch. Um, in terms of refinements to this design, Really, the thing Samsung talked about most was the updated uh, design on the back. The, the new um, the new sensor on the back has a, a larger surface area to make better contact with your skin. So you have increased accuracy 
um, with all of the, the the biometric readings, in addition to a new temperature sensor in there. So I'm sure there's going to be new use cases uh, as the software evolves for this device. Um, do either of you you know have a wearable that you that you use constantly, or is it just me that's a nerd? So, yeah, um, that's I smart. usually wear an old Amazfit watch uh, that actually does pretty well because it you know I get the notifications. It has some smart a couple smart features here and there but doesn't really get in the way but i really really like the look of these as i pull up tim's comment as well i mean these are very clean <laughs> they've got the full circle display um and they don't look overly bulky either so yeah. um i really really like that especially because i do have you know little little wrists so i can't wear too large of a watch or else it just looks yeah. bizarre on me um, yeah, I um I have the I have the the tiny uh, Galaxy Watch Four, like the smallest one, because I too have little little bony wrists, and um yeah, wearing a large watch is just it's it's too uncomfortable. I don't wear uh, smart watches as often as I used to. I'm not convinced that the use case is really there, um especially on on the Android side. Yeah. Google has had so many problems with Wear OS, and it was surprising for me last year that Samsung decided to, to drop ties in and go back to to the Android based uh, software. Um, yeah, but I mean, and I mean, they're sticking with it. Um, one thing that I am not I'm not crazy about with the new watches is that there's no option for a, a physical rotating bezel. That was always one of my favorite parts of, of Samsung's watches. Um, they're keeping, I think, the watch for classic around for people who, who want that. But I don't know that it's, I mean, you should probably just give up on it and just, you know, deal with the touch bezels or just, you know, just scroll normally. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the move to Sapphire Glass was smart. Um, that puts them in a, a better competitive place with the Apple Watch. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, these are like, you know, they're more iterative improvements. Um, I'm sure that they will be perfectly passable watches. Uh, I think that the Watch 5 Pro is priced ludicrously. It's $450. Uh, and like, yeah, it's got titanium and even stronger sapphire glass, but $450 for an Android powered smartwatch is a really tough sell. It's just the 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 experience I think is just not worth that much right now. I, th I think mm -hmm. with the watches, people tend to hold on to them longer than they would their phone like I, I don't know how many years i've had this and just going back to your point about the rotating dial i find i never use it right so i'm okay if that goes away i mm -hmm. do just swipe normally and the the most common use cases for me like what i find it's the best alarm clock in the world for me right because it doesn't disturb anybody mm -hmm. else and to have notifications you know like dial in your notifications to not have to pull your phone out of your pocket if you're at a movie or you're in a meeting whatever like that's the biggest thing i i, I know when yep. it's something important that i have to address or if it's something that i can just ignore and, and that's that exactly moment. what i've used smart watches yep. for it's just that heads up notification i don't really interact with the watch itself at all but if i can just see okay that's a message i need to respond to or yeah, it's a spam email I can disregard. Um, it really, really helps keep your focus on what you're doing because you're not pulling out your phone. You're not getting distracted with Twitter or Instagram or whatever your vice may be. It's just kind of lets you stay more in the flow without being totally disconnected. And, you know, with the, the Galaxy Watch 5 Pro being $450, if that experience is worth that price to you, I, I guess go for it. But I think the, you know, the regular watch five, um, starting at, what was it? 200 and two eighty. Uh, yeah, 280. 280. I think that's a lot more reasonable. Um, and I would imagine you're still getting a very good experience with that. Um, even if my smaller wrist would have me on the 40 millimeter with the smaller battery, but you yeah. know, is what it is. That's not Samsung's fault. Yeah. And, and the pro is only available in 45 millimeter. It's, it's a big watch. Yeah. Yeah, but going back to, to to the pricing and the the length of time customers tend to hold on to a watch. Let's say you kept it for three years, you know, hundred twenty bucks a year. I know it's it's pricey for that that initial outlay, but if you have a more durable watch with better battery life, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, I I can see why they're there. I too like probably three ninety nine would have been would have been more palatable yeah. for most people, but yeah, yeah I, I mean, you know, you. honestly, like you can get. Uh, that the the Watch Five Pro with LTE for only fifty bucks more. I feel like if you're looking at spending four fifty on that for the Bluetooth only one, you might as well spend the extra fifty and get LTE because then that'll. I mean, I think that'll make it more worthwhile to keep long term. Right, that would let you go on a run and not bring your phone along and that kind of thing. 
So I think uh, unless there's something else you guys want to add, we'll move on really quickly to the buds. I think I'll just do 10 seconds on those. Anything else on the watches you guys want to want to get in? Nope. Cool. So Galaxy Buds 2 Pro also launched. Um, these guys are slightly smaller, uh, perhaps a little more ergonomic. We weren't allowed to actually stick them in our ears. Um, five hours of battery life with ANC enabled. I think it was 18 hours if you include the case. And that nearly doubles if you shut off ANC. Um, the really the, the other real big upgrade is uh, support for 24-bit audio. So, you know, increased audio quality uh, through these buds. And I forget, Chris, do you remember what the starting price was? Um, I can quickly jump to it. Yeah. 229. I remember. 229. Um, and that's really the whole story on the buds. Is, is there anything else you guys want to add or should we move on to the big boy? That's about it. All right, cool. So let's go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum and talk about AMD's latest uh, Threadripper Pro 5000 series processors. They were actually launched back in March, um, but as really an OEM only product. They were just for system builders. Lenovo had a couple of beautiful machines with them, but AMD is now you know, putting these processors into the channel. You will be able to build your own Threadripper Pro. You could do it before, but you know, now it's you know officially going to be a thing where you can just buy a Threadripper Pro on Amazon. And we got to look at the, um, the Threadripper Pro 5695, I'm sorry, 5965. 5965 WX. This is the 24-core 48-thread version of the chip. Uh, yeah, 280-watt beast. I compared it to, I happen to have a 3975 WX, the previous gen 32-core, so really one notch up in the stack, and the 24-core standard Threadripper, in addition to a bunch of the other desktop processors that we you have on hand. And what's really interesting, right, when... When Zen 3 launched, I think lots of the enthusiasts were like, wow, I can't wait to see what Zen 3 does in a many core thread ripper because it was such a big upgrade in terms of single thread, in terms of multi thread, really in terms of efficiency, really across the board versus Zen 2. But unfortunately, no standard Zen 3 thread rippers arrived, right? So the pro version. What sets these apart from standard thread rippers, it's the same physical socket and number of pads on there, but these are basically like baby epics, right? You have eight channel memory, you have the 280 watt TDP, and you need the WRX80 uh, chipset, right? So it's a different chipset than what's on for, for standard thread rippers. All told, though, what a monster, right? So the platform itself, really high end, you know, all the IO you can imagine, 128. PCI Express four lanes on these chips and the motherboards, because the processors are so expensive, the motherboards are like commensurately high end and priced fairly high. The Asus motherboard I use for testing is a thousand dollar motherboard, but you really, you want for nothing, dual 10 gig ethernet, tons of, you know, M.2 slots. Every single expansion slot is an X16 with an X16 electrical connection. It's pretty nuts. And, you know, the processors performed as you'd expect much better single thread than the previous gen and in multi-threaded performance it never actually caught the 3970 to 32 core chip but due to all the efficiencies with zen 3 and you know the newer design it's right behind the 32 core chip and it like demolishes any of the desktop parts right so in some tests it was more than twice as fast as an alder lake core i9 12900k so beastly performance really out of you know a monster chip some caveats, some software doesn't run great on a mini core chip like this with the, uh, the memory architecture that AMD has implemented. But really, if you're looking for a like, high end, no compromise, no holds barred, multi threaded beast, it's nuts. So, uh, Chris, any, any thoughts on this? And then I'm going to throw a question Steve just uh, put up in there. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, these aren't going to be gaming chips, they're made for professional workloads first and foremost. I mean, I think we can see in Let's see, I'll pull up Time Spy here. You can see, you know, while a lot of these are, uh, you know, GPU bound, when we start to get down here, you know, it's not able to keep pace and it does hurt the frame rate versus the other processors. And and that kind of continues through the different benchmarks we see. It doesn't quite keep up with the regular mainstream gaming desktop chips in games. Um, yeah. But that's not what it's for. It's right. there for beastly compute and... Um, crushing rendering tasks and all other kinds of high workloads 
Yep. So Steve's uh, threw a comment in here. Some of the boards allow you to overclock using PBO and AMD said non-pro Threadripper is dead. So I tried to mess with Ryzen Master and PBO. It was not working. It said the processor wasn't recognized. It didn't mention anything on the motherboard, but I was super under the gun. I had some, uh, some family obligations this week and I, I burned through this review so fast that I really didn't do it the justice I should have. Um, I'm not sure non-pro Threadripper is dead. Uh, I had some conversations with somebody and even a Halleck way back on the last podcast said they'll have more to say about Threadripper soon. So we'll see what happens with Zen 4. I don't think we're going to see anything uh, anything else, perhaps not even in these platforms. We'll, we'll see. I, I can't say for sure. Uh, Ryan, is this kind of stuff that you're into too, uh, in addition to mobile devices, is monstrous desktop PCs? Uh, you, you um, think? I'm, I'm, I'm into PC hardware uh, enough that I can build my own rig. Um, I have a 5800 X right now, and that is fine for me. I'm, I'm not, I'm not out there trying to write like 2000 word think pieces on CPU architectures though. Gotcha. 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 Yeah. This thing is nuts. I'm, I'm on an old Threadripper now. I'm on a 2990 WX is my personal workstation for the last few years. Rock solid. It has given me no issues. I'm still on win 10 because this machine is so reliable. I don't want to hit that upgrade button. Hmm. Um, in terms of setting up a Threadripper Pro, if any of you watching this end up saying, oh, wow, I need one of these chips, um, I need one of these systems, some stuff to consider, right? So as I mentioned, the motherboard's super pricey. So I think the cheapest board was like 650 bucks, and they go up to above 1000 just for the motherboard. On top of that, you got to keep in mind, right, to get the best performance, get optimal performance, it's eight memory channels, so eight matched memory sticks two quad channel kits, right? You got to grab. So there's going to be some cost there because who's no one's going to buy, you know, four gig sticks. So you're going to end up buying two 32 gig kits at minimum. So it's going to be an investment there. This particular model processor we reviewed, right? 2965 WX is, is 2,400 bucks. That's a huge price for a 24 core chip. That's it, it compared to previous gens, a lot of money, no questions. The top end, the really sick 64 core, is like a $6,500 processor. So you really, really have to know that you're going to utilize it, that your your workflow is going to leverage all of that, all of those resources. Otherwise, wow, tons of money. Right. And there's power requirements you have to worry about, right? This 280-watt chip, all that memory. You, you got to make sure you got a beefy power supply. I ended up having to run to Best Buy because the case I was using wouldn't accommodate a 1600 watt EVGA power supply I had on hand. So I went to go buy a 1300 watts, it's a little smaller unit. Something weird about that one was tripping my uh, my UPS. If anybody watching this has ever bought a new power supply and it was incompatible with your, uh, your UPS, post a comment because I would love to know why. And then finally, huge motherboards, right? Extended ATX. Uh, the particular board, the ASUS board I use had right angle connectors. So a bunch of the headers I can't use because it's butted right up against the bottom of the uh, of the case. So lots of little quirks. Takes a lot longer to boot, but performance is nuts. If you're going to utilize, you know, the many the, the many cores, just you, nothing really can touch a Threadripper right now. Intel doesn't have. You have to go to a previous gen Skylake based Xeon. I think the highest core count is on a single. Uh, chip is 24, but it's a previous gen architecture. It just doesn't hang with these guys. Pretty nuts. Yeah, Steve's picked up on what I was thinking, which is that pricing aligns to about 100 bucks a core, which yeah. uh, you know, compared to your mainstream chips, is quite a premium. Maybe imagine paying 400 bucks for a quad core now. Like, right? You know, it's pricey, pretty but pricey. that's a lot of <laughs> silicon to put together. So, yeah, so understandable. I'm gonna, uh, going to play with the rig. Um, I'm probably going to put it in a different case and, and do some experiments. The, the Asus motherboard came with a, a, a four way M.2 uh, raid card. So you can get some like insane storage bandwidth mm -hmm. out of that thing. I'm probably going to play with that. If I can get four matched M.2 SSDs on hand, lots of cool stuff, but yeah, just a monstrous platform. You know, AMD is killing it in terms of uh, being able to use their chiplet design to have these many core chips out there. And with Zen 4 coming, I, even though mostly what I do doesn't utilize all these cores, except for the odd video render here and there, I can't wait to see what Zen 4 does with a, a many core chip like this. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And with that, what do you guys think? Should we wrap it up? We're, we're closing in on an hour. We're a little less than an hour. Yeah, I think uh, we've got some some rust to shake off on the live streaming side, but uh, <laughs> we did pretty well coming back. And thank you, Ryan, for for joining us. Um, yeah, no problem, man. Awesome. So anytime we have mobile stuff, we'll, we'll ping Ryan, see if we can have him back on. He's obviously definitely in the know on that stuff. Um, and with that, I think we will bid you adieu. Um, once again, if you haven't been by the site, hit hothardware.com. So much more content on the site that we simply just cannot talk about in the live stream. Uh, dozens of articles, dozens of news articles every day, in-depth reviews, um, tons of that stuff. And of course, we're all over the web. We're here on YouTube at YouTube slash hot hardware. We're on Instagram, Twitter slash hot hardware, Facebook.com uh, slash hot hardware. We're all over the place. Interact with us. We love to hear from everybody. And uh, if you're so inclined, please like and subscribe. We would love to build a channel this year. And if you want to hit us up on Patreon, do that because, you know, everyone can use a, you know a little help support here independent journalism right and support where are that's a really great point we're one of the last big independent tech uh, publications online been around over 20 years so support guys like us because you don't want every publication to be the same right and with that uh, I think we'll bid you do thanks a lot everybody <laughs>